Hey everybody. All right, so we are currently in the middle of a project uh, for the Stellar Robotics 2018 CAD class. And what we're doing is we're learning about pneumatics and we're learning about um, how to do layout sketches for pneumatic cylinders and, and how to use pneumatic cylinders to um, move a mechanism. Uh, so I, I have here, I have the, a model of um, Team 5413's 2016 robot. This robot was um, for the, the game Stronghold. Um, and I wanted to use it as an example of, of a way that we used a, a pneumatic um, joint, I guess. So we have this intake mechanism here. And it goes up and down. I don't know if I have this. Yeah. So it folds up something like that. Uh, there's this pneumatic cylinder here, which is the, the silver thing right in the middle of the screen. And it's attached at the back and uh, right at the rod end to the, the actual pivoting portion of the mechanism. So it's, it's attached to just part of the structure back here and it's attached to um, the part that pivots here. And you've got this lever arm. Um, and then when the cylinder extends, if I can grab this, it extends forward and it rotates this down. We're going to design something very similar. Actually, we're probably going to use this same cylinder. Um, this is a cylinder we use quite a bit. It just seems like this size works out um, for this application fairly frequently. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to start from scratch and we're going to do a layout sketch. We're going to figure out the we're going to figure out all of the off-the-shelf parts that we need uh, download the CAD models for that uh, and do all that. Um, the I guess the, the difficult part about this project is that when it comes down to it, when you're designing a robot, at the end of the day, the, the specific structure that you use to mount cylinders and, and the exact mechanism that you're rotating, the amount of force you require to, to lift something up or down, and um, you know the amount of stroke you need, and all of those variables are very, very robot specific, especially when it comes to exactly what the brackets look like to mount the cylinder. You know, we did it like this for this particular application for other robots it's looked completely different so we're going to kind of we're going to kind of assume some things we're going to we're going to make some assumptions we're going to um just kind of mock this up um, with an understanding that a lot of the structure involved in this example will change depending on what the robot's design is so that's what we're going to do um, I'm going to close out of this. Now we're going to go, we have to, we have to create a layout sketch, but the first thing we have to do before we have to do that is we have to get some dimensions from an air cylinder. So we're going to actually download the CAD for our air cylinder and import that first. Now, like I said, most of the time, um, this is going to be very, very robot specific. Um, but in our case, I'm just going to pick an air cylinder that we're going to use, and we're going to use that for an ex our example, um, and then not really go into so much exactly which uh, air cylinders you would select for which applications, because um, that's kind of outside the scope of the class. Um, all right, so we're going to go with round body air cylinders. We're going to go double acting. Um, all this information about what this stuff is is in the um, engineering and COTS segment for week eight of the CAD class. So we're going to go for a four inch stroke length and a one and a sixteenth inch bore size. This is, like I said, this is a size we used quite a bit. We're going to go for the universal mount, which is this image right here. It's got like basically a, a hole for a clevis pin on the back, so that allows the back of the cylinder to mount like we just saw in the example from our 2016 robot. So we're going to go ahead and download this, get a step file going here. You know, while that's downloading, I'm going to go back. Uh, we're also going to need this, this thing right here, rod clevis with pin. 
um, we use these. A lot of teams use these like swiveling rod ends, and we've used that maybe once on Stellar Robotics. Um, I, I just find they take up an annoyingly large amount of room, and in a lot of cases, the clevises are able to handle enough misalignment that you don't need the like swiveling nature of that. But you know, you'll know you see both on robots pretty frequently. So we're going to download a CAD file of this as well. Um, OK, so we're going to show these in the folder. Got to cut both of these out of there. I created a folder called uh, CAD class pneumatic joint. I've already gone through this design kind of once. Now, this is something I noticed earlier. Um, this is K43. I believe it has a zero. Yeah. So we're going to call this Clevis because this is the second file we downloaded. So this this is the air or this is the air cylinder and this is the Clevis. So that'll help us know which file is which. All right. So I need to get out of here and go to my. So I've got one that I've done already. Okay. So we need to just like we did on the gearbox example we're going to find our step file that we pasted in and we're going to open it um, in order to import it into inventor let it load here we'll click ok to the dialog once it comes up now i'm not going to on on the gearbox i paid uh, quite a bit of attention to exactly how much each thing weighed. These cylinders aren't modeled quite right. They're modeled solid, right? This is solid. So when we set the material, it's probably going to end up being heavier than it actually will be in real life. Um, but I'm not particularly worried about that. Okay, so we've got to delete this sketch that uh, Inventor automatically puts in there. We're going to set the material to stainless steel actually only this middle part on the actual cylinder stainless steel and, and the rod these these like end caps here are aluminum but this is good enough for what we're doing okay so in the CAD class we haven't talked a whole lot about solid bodies but basically you can create parts that actually are made up of more than one solid so like if you think of if you think of modeling a screw and a nut say in one part, right? So not modeling a nut and modeling a screw and then putting them together in assembly. You could if you wanted to. This is kind of a bad example because I don't see any situations where you'd actually do this. But you could model the screw and the nut together in one part and actually create them as separate solid bodies. And That's a little hard to explain, but in this case we've got a pretty good example that's, that's pretty much just what I just said. We've got these nuts on here, right? So these are actually in real life. These are these are nuts that you can unthread. Um, so it's actually a separate part, but it's modeled in here just kind of as a representation. But we don't want this here, right? Because we're going to want to put a pin through this hole, um, and we're going to want to use this. So we we want this nut gone. Well, here if we go up to the browser over here on the the left hand side, if we go to solid bodies, we can see there are five solid bodies. If we hover over them, we can see a couple of things. So you know this is the front nut. If we right click and turn off the visibility, it turns that whole chunk off and then we can see there are threads underneath, which is pretty convenient. So so like normally that nut, that front nut is not necessary. We would take it off to save weight in, in our, our um, intended application here. This is, I'll get to this in a second. That's the main body of the cylinder. This is the back nut, which we're also going to turn off. And then you can see this is actually how we'll use the cylinder. So we're going to do one other thing here. We're going to go ahead and add our work axis. The zoom is acting really annoying today. Okay, so I'm going to click on work axis. I'm going to just click the center of the cylinder because that will be a cylindrical surface that's, you know, through the center of the whole thing. And this gives us um, the center of the rod as well, which is really what we're more interested in. Um, you could have clicked the rod too, but the whole thing's cylindrical, so everything's concentric. Um, and then we're also going to put an axis here because that's how we're going to pin the cylinder. Now, we have three solid bodies. One of them, this one, is the main body of the cylinder. And then we've got this one here, which you can see is the rod. You can see here, which is kind of like not really showing. Let's hide this first one here. And you can see we've got, it's also the rod. 
but it's in a different position. So, so these two solid bodies, this one here that I just hid, and, and the one that's, that's here, which is this bottom one in the list, this is representing this, the rod in the extended position, and this is representing the rod in the retracted position. That's pretty useful, because you can represent the, the, the cylinder in each of its two main positions. Now, the thing that you cannot do with solid bodies is, is move the rod, right? Now, you could make this into an assembly that has two parts. Typically, I, you, you don't need that level of realism in a CAD model. So typically, I just turn off the cylinder in its extended state and um, show it in its retracted state, which is typically good enough for um, representing what I want to represent. So uh, we're done here. We've got material set. We've got our geometry turned off that we want to turn off. We've got our work axis, so we're just going to give it a save. I'm just using Control S on my keyboard to do that. All right, so now we're going to open again, and we're going to open the clevis this time. We're going to do a similar process. Once it loads, okay, click OK. Then we're going to need to delete out the default sketch just because it's in there. We're going to set the material to steel, and then because these are zinc plated, I want to set the material appearance. Uh, I set the material to steel. I want to set the appearance to zinc, right? Because it's zinc plated, it's covered in zinc. So. Um, when you buy these, they come with this pin and these two eclipse. Once again, these this is modeled as one part, but each of these things are solid bodies. So we can expand the list and find. I'm just holding Control to select more than one. I'm going to turn off the visibility. So this is how we're going to use it. We're going to make our own pin, and actually, I think we're going to use a, a screw. But um, yeah, we're going to we're going to use our own pin, so we don't need to use the one that comes with it. Um, this nut down here. <clears throat> this is what's called a jam nut. So basically, the cylinder rod has threads on it, right? Um, but there's no, there's nothing really to tighten down against. You you could try to tighten down against the end of the threads, but that's typically not going to work out very well for you. It's not going to really get tight, um, and you run the risk of of damaging damaging one or both of the parts. So so tightening it down against the end of the threads really isn't an option. Um, but you can't just thread this clevis on without the nut because, you know, they're just straight threads like a normal screw, and this would just be able to, to spin off. Because um, keep in mind that this rod here can actually rotate inside the cylinder. Now, there are kinds of cylinders that prevent that, um, but this is not one of them. Um, and this is a really cheap, really low cost um, type of cylinder. So, so this rod can rotate, which means under vibration, you know, the clevis can't rotate because it's it's pinned in one clocking orientation. But the rod could spin its way out of the clevis. Um, so basically, what you do is you use what's called a jam nut, which is you take another nut and you thread it on the same set of threads and basically you tighten the nut and the, the thing that you're threading on, in this case the clevis, you thread them on and then tighten them against each other. And that's fairly common practice in situations where you need to, to suspend something kind of like in the middle of a long run of threads, like on a threaded rod or something, is, is you use what's called jam nuts. And there's actually a whole type of nut type of hex nut called jam nuts where they're thin like this because normally a hex nut would be like a lot thicker in this direction but this is a, a special kind of nut called a jam nut that's thinner and the reason it's thinner is just because it doesn't have to the, the most of the load is not being borne on the jam nut most of the load being borne on the actual threaded thing that you care about in this case the clevis and the jam nuts just keeping this from being able to spin in relation to the threaded shaft um, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, don't worry about it. Um, it's just this nut needs to be here. They're both going to be on the shaft, so we're not going to turn this nut off because we're going to use it. All right, so we're going to put in our work axes here, um, one through there, and then we've got to find a way to get it through the middle. Um, we just got to find a round surface. This should be round. I believe these little like corners, like on the nut. We can click on one, and you can see because this is actually a round surface that's that's all the way around the part. 
um, you can see we can get an access through there. When, when you're importing parts like this, it's really just kind of a guessing game. A little bit of trial and error is typically involved um, as to what you can actually pick, especially when you're downloading parts from McMaster Car because they have all these crazy threads in them. <clears throat> but that's why I like their models is because they look super, super realistic. So, all right, we're going to give this a save with a control S again. All right, so now we're going to create an assembly. Um, we're going to use standard.iam right here. We're going to click create. Okay. Go to home view. All right, so remember in the last CAD class, I talked to you guys about this is the one I completed. Um, talk to you guys about how you can write drag um, to access that menu. I'll go over that again here in a second. But we're going to place the cylinder body in this assembly. We're just going to, this orientation is fine, so we're just going to place grounded at origin. I'm going to press escape to get out of that. Um, so once again, I'm moving my mouse up, right? you got to start moving the mouse first. So you start moving the mouse up, then I press and hold right click. I'm still holding the button, and then I let go of the button. Okay, so I'm going to press escape to get out of this, and we're going to try that again. So you can do it really fast. So start moving the mouse, press and hold right click, release right click. Okay, so do it fast, just like that. It's just a little flick of the mouse. And and basically, if I just right click normally, you can see this like pinwheel of, um, I don't know what it's actually called. I call it the pinwheel, but I don't, I don't know what it's actually called. Um, basically, whichever direction that you swipe your mouse when you're right dragging like that, whichever direction it is corresponds to whatever direction on this pinwheel that, that you're going to be activating a command. So if you go up in this like in this kind of range of directions you can see this little like cone here um, or triangle pie slice maybe uh, it's place component if I go like off at this angle it's gonna do the constraint tool if I go straight to the side it's gonna do a pa pattern component so anyways that's that's a way to access stuff really fast all right, so we're going to do the, the clevis next. I'm going to rotate. Uh, well, basically, we want the axis in this clevis, the, the two holes that are going across, we want those to be facing the same direction as this back axis of the cylinder. Um, so I'm going to rotate it. Uh, we'll start once by Z, and then I need to roll it in the Y. And you can see, like I was doing on the, on the last set of videos, um, I like to try to keep the origin of the part in a somewhat reasonable um, state. So you can see like the Z axis is pointing up. So that's that's fine. It's not really critical. That's just what I do. All right, so I'm going to click to place it down, then press escape to get out of that tool. All right, so we're going to constrain. Remember, right drag at a 45 degree angle up and to the right. Um, or you can click the constraint button up here on the ribbon. Or you can just right click and click constraint. There's at least three ways to do every command in Inventor as far as I know. All right, so we're going to constrain. We're going to constrain uh, using a mate constraint. We're going to constrain the center axes of these two to each other. We're going to click apply. You can also press enter. Um, all right, so then we need to constrain. We want the end of this nut to basically be at the end of the threads. So we're going to select this flat face and then we're going to try to find a face to constrain to. Now, because I've worked with this model before, I know that there is a fat, flat flat face right here that we can use. If there's not a flat face available, you can also go with a center point. So if you find an arc, like this is an arc, right? I'm actually on the edge. I'm not on the cylinder. You can see if I'm on the cylinder, this is a cylindrical surface. If I'm on the cylindrical surface, it's picking the center line of the cylinder, which is not what I want. If I'm picking the, the flat face, obviously I'm picking the flat face. But if I'm picking the arc, you see that little green dot? Basically that green dot represents the center point of the arc, which um, is basically what it will do is it will constrain it so this flat face intersects this point, which would accomplish what we want to accomplish because this is already lined up with this axis. Um, but I'm going to pick the flat, flat face because that just feels like a cleaner way to do it. Okay, so next I want to, if I'm going to press escape to get out of this, I can rotate this clevis, right, which I don't want to be able to do that. I want this clevis to be horizontal just like this axis is here. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the constraint tool and I'm going to go, this is a constraint that we haven't actually used yet, but we're going to go to the angle uh, button and we're going to pick this one here, directed angle on the right. Then I'm going to pick this center line. You can see the arrow coming out of the center line and you can pick this center line. Now it's actually going to flip the clevis around. It's, it's basically what it's going to do is it's going to make the two arrows point in the same direction once I click on this one here. But I, I, I don't care. Like, that's fine. It, the clevis is, is reversible, so it doesn't matter to me. So I'm just going to click on this one. It flipped the clevis around 180 degrees. Now they're facing the same direction. If I click Apply and press Escape, now I can't rotate, I can't rotate the clevis anymore. So that's what, I, that's what I want. Now, we have one other problem. The clevis should be able to extend with the cylinder, right? Now, the actual model of the cylinder itself, the rod won't extend, but the bottom line is this clevis will be able to move. So when the cylinder extends, this clevis will be able to move four inches in this direction. Because um, <clears throat> it's a four inch stroke cylinder. When um, we want, we well, we basically we want this model to represent that in some way. So really what we want to be able to do is we want to move the clevis and we don't really care so much that the rod's not going to be there. Um, it's going to look kind of funky because it's going to look like the clevis will be floating in midair, but that's not really an issue. That's just a, a graphical thing and won't really affect any of the actual function of our CAD model. So we're going to, we're going to click on this clevis, find it in the browser. We're going to expand it using a little arrow. We're going to go down and find the, the constraint that, that constrained it against that flat face on the rod, which should be this second mate. We're going to right click on this and we're going to click edit. Okay. So what you can do is you can actually specify. So normally you can specify an offset, right? So if I type in this offset and I type in like one inch and I press enter, right? It moves, it moves the clevis out away from this flat face, um, as you would expect. Okay. And if I go and do, you know, minus, I just double click to access this dialog minus 0.5, right? It's going to move it like back into the part. Okay, so if I go back to edit, I'm going to set this to zero. I'm going to edit again. Okay, so basically w what you can also do is you can define a range for the offset. So instead of instead of just saying I want it spaced one inch off, you could say I want it to ma maintain the range of one to two inches or something, or zero to three inches. Or in our case, it's going to be zero to four inches, right, because it's a four-inch stroke. So this represents it in the retracted position and, and then out in the extended position would be four inches farther than that. So normally, uh, depending on how Inventor comes up by default, your dialog might look like this. If it looks like this, click these two like double like carrot symbols. I guess that's not a carrot. Uh, greater than symbols, whatever the two arrows. Uh, click that, and it'll it'll kind of expand this region underneath. So we want to, in the case of and and pretty much all constraints allow you to do this. In this particular case, we're using a mate constraint, but you can do this with angle constraints. You can do this with flushes. You can do this with tangent constraints. You can do this with all kinds of stuff. So if we click maximum. And we can also check minimum too. We, we need both. So check both of those. And the maximum is going to be four inches. The minimum minimum is going to be zero, just like it is now. So if we click OK, um, you can see the mate shows up and it has a little plus or minus beside it, which tells us that there's a range. Uh, and then if we click and drag on this clevis, it will move in and out. And you can see that it, like I can't get it to go past this point, which tells us you know that's the four inches of extension. So this acts like the clevis would in real life. Now, in, in real life, this rod would extend with the clevis. Um, however, in our particular case, that's not uh, possible without a considerable amount more work, which if you really care about the aesthetics of your CAD model, you can absolutely make that work um, by creating an assembly of the cylinder instead of a solid monolithic part. However, in the context of an FRC build season, you're way too crunched for time, and that's typically not a good a good use of your time to make things do uh, work that way just for aesthetics. So, um, this is the assembly of our cylinder that we're going to use. Now, we're going to need a pretty important dimension that for, uh, dimension from this model here in a second, but we're going to go ahead and save this first. This is the one that I've already completed. 
All right, so we're going to call this SR18. So this is for CAD class, and then we're going to call it PJ for pneumatic joint. And then we're going to call this uh, assembly one. Okay, that's kind of the part numbering system that we used on Stellar Robotics uh, for a lot of stuff. And it just allows us to number parts and assemblies so that we don't have to worry about naming things. Because if you've got an assembly that has you know, a couple hundred parts or something, naming each thing logically is actually quite time consuming. So it's quite a bit faster to just a number stuff because typically you don't really care what it's actually called. It's just a part and it's going to be in an assembly somewhere. So um, we always number things. Uh, but we, we keep some information in it that shows us what mechanism or what project it's to. All right, so I'm going to press the M key to activate the measure tool. And what I want to know is I want to know the distance from the center line here at the back through this pivot, so this construction or this um, work axis. I want to know the distance from the center line of that pin to the center line of this pin here, which is going to be this work axis. So if I click both of those, I can see that that distance is 9.02 inches. Okay, and I'm going to need to know that distance in the retracted position and in the extended position. However, I know that this cylinder has a four inch stroke. So I know that in the extended position, this is going to be four inches longer than it is now. <clears throat> so it'll be instead of 9.02, it'll be 13.02. And if you don't believe me, we can move this out and then we can activate the measure tool using the M key again. Nope, I hit N, hit M. And then we pick the center line at the back of the cylinder, center line on the clevis, and we can see 13.02 inches. So uh, we're going to leave this in the retracted position, give this model a save real quick. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to move to our layout sketch. We're going to need that, we're going to need that number, 9.02 and 13.02 inches. So we're going to create a new file. This is going to be a standard part, so standard.ipt, click create. So we're presented with a sketch. All right, so if you remember from when I showed you the CAD model of the 2016 robot, we have we have a, a place that's fixed, that's a, there's a fixed amount where the, the back end of the cylinder, where this pin is, right? There's, there's some bracketry that holds this in place, and then this end of the cylinder typically mounts to whatever is moving. Now, you can flip that around, and, and actually on this past season's robot, or Arcturus, um, for the 2018 season. Uh, we actually did that on our initial intake, which didn't work very well, by the way. But uh, we had it flipped around. And, and the, really, the only reason for doing one or the other really just has to do with, do you want the holes, these holes here are where the, the pneumatic fittings screw in, where you, you hook the hoses up to run the cylinder. It's just whether you want them to move with with the mechanism or stay roughly fixed in position on the the base assembly. So in most cases you want the the part that moves the least. So in this case on on the 2016 robot this end was connected essentially to the drivetrain so it didn't move at all. And then the the cylinder just kind of pivoted a little bit as as the arc of the mechanism worked. Um so you you didn't have to have much extra length of hose to account for that motion. However, on Arcturus, uh, it made, because it was so cramped, it made a lot more sense to actually run the tubes up into the mechanism and then out onto the cylinder rather than trying to run tubes from the drivetrain onto the cylinder. And it, so, so really, it just depends on where you want to run the tubes. On Stellar Robotics, we typically don't model tubes or anything in CAD just because that's very, very time consuming. Um, and we're, we're crunched for time during the build season. However, um, we always do keep in mind kind of where stuff's going to go to make sure there's actually room for it. Um, somewhat, sometimes more or less successfully than uh, others, but that's what we try to do. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a a tube, right? We're going to have a, a piece of one by one aluminum tubing that's going to kind of act as the base for this assembly. We're going to pretend that that tube is part of our drivetrain or part of some other mechanism that this pivoting joint is attached to. 
Now, this is the part where I was talking about earlier, where this is really just going to depend on what your, you know, what your robot looks like, what your mechanism looks like. And so most of the structure part of this example is really going to be kind of relative. It'll be kind of an example, and it'll have to be heavily adapted to match whatever the application is. However, we're going to have a tube. Um, that's what we're going to use as the base. It could be a sheet metal drivetrain, could be a kit bot, could be it could be a tube if it's um, a West Coast drivetrain. It could be um, a, a part of an arm if you have a pneumatic joint attached to some other you know joint like an arm. Um, but we're just going to draw a horizontal line here. It's kind of hard to see on this um, this axis line here, but there's a there's a horizontal line here. This is going to represent the top of our one by one um, tubing. Okay, so we need to locate two center points. We need to locate, well, actually three, but let's let's focus on two for now. So we need to locate, we need to locate where the back of this is. Okay, so it's going to be somewhere up above the base, up above the top of this tube, because the cylinder is going to reside kind of in this area a lot, like it did on the 2016 robot. Um, uh, if that's at all confusing, we're we're actually going to be looking the the 2016 robots. The way that I had it pulled up here was actually backwards from the way I'm going to model this, um, but don't let that confuse you. Um, so the back of the cylinder is going to be on this end. The clevis is going to be here. Our our pivot for the joint is going to be somewhere in this area. We'll get to that in a second. But anyways, we need to locate the the back the center line of the back of the cylinder somewhere above above the surface of the tube and and back over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a line. We're going to connect it to the end of this line here. Make sure we get the green dot before we click. We're going to go up. And I don't know, let's just do 1.5 inches. Now, obviously, I've modeled this before, so I know that this dimension actually works. But this dimension here, once again, is very, very dependent on your application. It depends on what cylinder you're using. Because, you know, the cylinder obviously is going to hang down below that because this is the center point here. But, you know, the cylinder has a thickness, so you got to make sure there's room for that. And if you're using a really large cylinder, this might need to be larger um, or, or something. So this point at the end point of this line will represent where this back pivot of the cylinder will go. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing on the other end, except this is going to represent the pivot point of the mechanism itself. And we actually want this to be... Uh, actually, I think I screwed that up. So we're going to do 1.5 inches here, and we're going to do 2 inches here. We may adjust these later. but um, So this is going to represent the actual pivot point of the mechanism itself. Now, in our case, we don't know what the mechanism is. We're not modeling a mechanism. We don't have a robot to design. Um, so we're just going to kind of have a piece of one-by-one one tubing that can rotate that we're going to pretend is the mechanism. Now, we want that piece of one-by-one one tubing to start vertically, and fold down 90 degrees. <clears throat> in this particular layout sketch, that is very unimportant. So we're not even going to bother, mo bother modeling it. We'll fill it in later once we actually start modeling parts. So let's, um, let's draw on our cylinder. Now we're going to draw the cylinder in, in two, two positions. So we're going to draw it in its um, retracted position first which is going to be a line of the length 9.02 inches. So essentially what this represents is this front of the line here. You're going to want, you're going to want some space between this line and the end point of this line. So if, if you did what I did and it ended up on this side of it, drag it over to make sure that it's um, not in your way later. Um, so this represents obviously the back pivot of the cylinder like we said before, which is why it's connected to the end of this line. And this point at the end of this line here represents the, the center point of the clevis. Okay. So now we need the cylinder in its extended position. So we're going to connect to the same back point where the back pivot of the cylinder is going to go. We're going to move the line out here. I'm going to type in 13.02 and press enter. I'm going to press escape to end that. Now we want the end point of this line on, on this side of the line. That will become apparent why that is here in a second. Okay, so obviously there aren't two air cylinders in this assembly. There's there's just one air cylinder. But in the case of our layout sketch, we're drawing it in two different positions to make sure that all of our geometry kind of is consistent across the full range of motion. 
Now, if we wanted to, we could draw this in three or four different positions if we wanted to. But in this particular case, air cylinders, you know, have two primary positions and, and the kind of state in between where it's in the process of extending or in the process of retracting is very, very rapid and isn't particularly important. Um, but if we got into a case where we were worried about the cylinder hitting something else or there was something important that happened midway in the stroke or, or something like that, we might model it in more than one position than, than these two. But in the vast majority of cases, you're going to model it in the retracted position and the extended position. Okay, so in order to convert linear motion, which is provided by the air cylinder, in order to convert that linear motion into a rotary motion, we have to have some sort of a lever arm, okay? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line from the center point to the end point of the cylinder in its retracted position. Okay, so this represents a lever arm, right? We don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but there's going to be some mechanical connection between this point and and this point. And and remember, this point here is the pivot of the of the entire mechanism that we want to move up and down. Um, Okay, so, well, we know that we have a lever arm here. Well, we know that we need another lever arm um, from here to, to the extended position. Now, the thing to remember here is this line and this line represent, just, just like this line and this line both represent the same cylinder in two different positions, this line and this line represent the same lever arm in two different positions, okay? So what that means is the lever arm is not going to be able to change length throughout the stroke of the cylinder, right? It, it's the same mechanical part. It's not going to change size. So we know that these two lines need to be the same length. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an equals constraint here. And we're going to click on one line and we're going to click on the other. And basically what the equals constraint does is it, when you click on two lines, it makes them the same length, which is what we want. So now if we can click and drag on this. Both of the lines change size at the same time. Okay, so now um, we know that we want the stroke, the angular stroke, I should say. We know the stroke of the cylinder, obviously, but we want the we want the angular stroke of the mechanism to be 90 degrees. We want it so to pivot 90 degrees. Now, in the case that I showed you earlier of the 2016 robot, um, that was quite a bit more than 90 degrees. You can get theoretically, you can get anything less than 180 degrees worth of rotation out of a pneumatic cylinder. Um, once you start getting very, very close to 180, things start to break down and it doesn't become practical anymore. Um, so practically speaking, you can get up to 120. Typically, you can push that a little bit farther if you need to, but, but typically 120 is kind of the limit. In our case, we're going to go with 90, which is a really kind of a moderate I suppose, number. It's really, really easy to get 90 degrees of stroke using an air cylinder. So um, what we're going to do is we're just going to constrain these two lines to be 90 degrees apart. And and what, what that represents, once again, is this was representing the, the lever arm while the cylinder is retracted. This is representing the lever arm while the cylinder is extended. And we know we want those to be 90 degrees apart. So we just use a dimension and constrain it that way, and that'll help us kind of nail down our geometry. So we're going to type in 90 and press enter. Um, press escape to get out of that. All right, so so now you can see our, our sketch is still fairly un unconstrained. So we can we can click and drag, and we can see down here in the corner, we can see we need one dimension. Um, and essentially what that comes down to is we can move this back in and out, and you can see how it changes, changes the cylinder positions. So um, let's talk about torque for a second. Now, week, I, I believe it was week eight. It might have been week seven. Um, no, it wasn't week eight. I think it was week seven. Week seven of the class, we talked about torque and moment arms. And essentially, um, the thing to remember is when you're exerting a force, right, and this cylinder is exerting a force, and it's exerting a force down the center line of the cylinder. So, so this line here is the center line of the cylinder in the retracted position. This line here is the center line of the cylinder in the extended position. In the retracted position, you know, the cylinder is pushing forward. It's pushing forward along the center line of the cylinder. 
Um, so this is the force line. So if we continue this force line out, right, it, the distance between the force line, and I'm actually just going to draw a construction line here to make this a little easier to understand. I'm just going to give it a length, like four inches or something. And I'm going to set it to be collinear. I'm going to delete this later, so don't, don't worry about it. Um, so essentially, the distance between this line and the pivot point of whatever you're rotating, this is the moment right here. So if I, if I place another line in here, and I just connect it to this line, and then I need to make these two lines perpendicular. So this, so this line here, this is the moment, OK? So this is essentially the effective leverage length that the cylinder has. So, so the cylinder is going to have the same amount of force throughout its whole stroke, because the force is defined by the surface area of the piston in the cylinder and the, the amount of air pressure in the cylinder. So um, it's going to have the same amount of force throughout the, its, full, its full stroke. However, as you can see here, depending on what angle the cylinder is at in relation to the lever arm, you know, here the um, moment is quite long, and, and, and down here the moment's quite short. So, so this will be, uh, this will provide quite a bit more torque in this position than it will in this position, just because the moment arm is shorter. So let's draw something here. Let's draw an arc. And we're, this is a permanent part of the assembly because it makes it a little easier to visualize. Uh, I have construction geometry turned on. I picked a center point arc, which is the bottom one in this op, uh, option drop down. Uh, I'm going to click to place the center point on the actual pivot point of the mechanism. I'm going to place one end point at the end point of the cylinder in the retracted position. And I'm going to place the other end point in on the end point of the cylinder in the extended position. So this represents the arc that the center line of the clevis axis or as clevis pin will follow as the cylinder extends. Because the remember the lever arm the lever arm is um a, a, you know a fixed length so it's gonna follow an arc. So the cylinder is gonna kinda go go up and then it's gonna come back down as you can see here. So the thing to remember is that the moment, the moment is always going to be the distance from the force line, which is the center line of the cylinder, the distance from that line to the center point, you know, measured, me measured perpendicularly. So as you can see, as the cylinder goes, as the cylinder starts to extend, it's going to go up this arc. What that's going to do is it's really going to, it's really going to make the moment arm longer and your torque is going to increase. So you're going to start extending. Remember, the cylinder has a fixed amount of force as far as we're concerned. However, as it starts to extend and it gets higher on this arc, the moment arm is going to increase, which means the torque that it's able to generate is going to increase. And then once it peaks, it's going to peak somewhere around here. And then it's going to start to come back down and the torque is going to decrease again. Now, depending on the mechanism, that may or may not be a problem. Okay, I'm going to delete these lines out of here because I'm done with them. Um, however, in our case, we really don't want a right. So if we do, if we position this like this, right, the torque is going to be very, very low at the beginning. It's going to increase a lot, and it's going to stay pretty high all the way to the end. Okay, it's going to peak somewhere around here and then it's going to decrease a little bit to here, but not much. So we're going to start with a very low torque, and we're going to finish with a very high torque, and that's where we're going to be. If we go the other way, we will start with a very high torque. I mean, this is pretty much going to be peak torque right here because these are close to 90 degrees. And then the torque will decrease as we extend. That's that. Remember, this, this really comes down to the application of your mechanism. But in our case, we want kind of an even keel pretty consistent torque all across the range of motion. So what we want to do is we want to get these so that they have as close to a balance. We don't want one higher than the other. So what we're going to do is we're just going to align these two lines. So that the start and end center lines are along the same path. So we have the same starting and ending torque. And what that'll do is it'll be somewhere around here, right? This provides a good balance between the, the range of torque represented throughout the range of motion. Now, if this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, 
um, you, you, you can review the um, torque and moment arms handout and that will help um, clarify some of the terminology I'm using and there's some diagrams on there that go do a little better job explaining exactly what the moment arm is. Um, once again, this will, this will depend on the robot and the mechanism in question, but this is what we're going to do. So we want to line these two lines up. So we're going to use the collinear constraint. We're going to click on one, we're going to click on the other. And then press escape to get out of that tool. <clears throat> As you can see, um, we're now fully constrained. Everything's locked down. So once again, to review, this line here represents the cylinder in the retracted position. This line here represents the cylinder in the extended position. These two lines here represent the lever arm in the uh, retracted position and the extended position, respectively. This point here represents uh, the pivot point of the mechanism. This point here represents the pivot point of the air cylinder, or the back of the air cylinder. Um, and this line here represents the top of a piece of uh, tubing that we're using uh, to mount this whole assembly to. So basically what we're going to need is we're going to need a, a tube. We're going to need some brackets to hold uh, the bearings or bushings. I think we'll use bushings for the pivot point of the mechanism. We need some brackets at the back to hold the um, back of the cylinder. Uh, and then we're going to need some sort of dummy mechanism. We're going to start with a, a two by one tube that sticks straight up and then rotates down 90 degrees. <clears throat> so we need some way to build this lever arm into the tube. So if we have a tube that's going vertically like this, we need some way to attach this lever arm to the tube. So I'm going to end this video here. Uh, next time we're going to come back, we're going to model, um, we're going to start modeling some parts and getting some stuff in an assembly and uh, this will start to take shape. So real quick, I'm going to save this because um, I forgot to do that before. We're going to call this, I'm going to name it Layout001. Delete the IAM because it's not an assembly. Save that. Okay. Um, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.